we're up to the next topic, which is the, so if you remember last week, we created uh, virtual machines and uh, hopefully understood a little bit about the uh, virtual hard disk and whatnot. And like I said, a lot of a lot of what we covered last week, as far as the virtual machine goes, is going to be very familiar with uh, what we already know in VMware. And that's the same with the virtual networking. So if you remember in VMware, we have virtual switches. Okay. So can anyone name the in VMware workstation the default virtual switches when you install it? Uh, can I have a guess here? You shouldn't be guessing. You should be telling no. me because uh, <laughs> well, uh, you should know. Uh, what I was trying to say was, well, can I just, if I, if I know a couple, so isn't it, um, isn't it the external and internal and private, if I remember correctly? It depends. What are they called? What are the virtual switches called? Uh, that's what I was trying to say. Like, isn't it, so the virtual switches would be based off of the, um, based off the type of network you want, basically. So I was trying to say external would connect you up to the physical network. So the way I'd describe that basically is with our, uh, Simon, if we wanted to connect to the production network, um, it would I be think external. you're on the right track, but you're using the wrong words, Matthew. Better get my grammar better. Maybe yeah, no, no, not so much. We need to be obviously communicating on the same level yeah, when we're no. talking about the same technology. <clears throat> so I think every one of us have done the four IVM subjects. So if you remember the def the default, <laughs> excuse me, my dog's seen something outside. Uh, Default free networks we get is uh, is basically bridged, host only, and NAT. Okay, they're the free networks. They have uh, different functions, and basically most of the function is. Ba uh, excuse me, guys. I'm just gonna. <laughs> I was I was just thinking that is it the bird again? <laughs> Good question. It it always happens at this time, doesn't it? Uh, did you not know, Raymond, that last time it was uh, a case of um, there was there was a bird that distracted Alex's dog last time? Oh, I'm sorry about again. that. Uh, she, uh, she's seen someone walking uh, uh, somewhere. Uh, anyway, back back to what I was talking about. Like uh, <clears throat> in VMware Workstation, we had the three default networks: uh, bridge, NAT, and host only. Okay, but they're not the virtual switches. The virtual switches are actually called VMNet One. VMNet 2, uh, sorry, VMNet 8 and VMNet 0. So 1 was the host only, 8 was the NAT, and uh, what's the 0 was bridged. So I think from what Matthew was saying, the bridge is what he would have called external, uh, which basically gave you direct access to the physical network. Uh, the NAT was a, as the, as, as the name suggests, network address translation. It basically represents uh, similar to what you have at home, with a local area network that you're in charge of, and it's not uh, not the uh, not the internet, and there's a NAT device which is your ADSL router that translates f into the public uh, internet. But in the virtual world, that's a translation from the host only network, uh, host only network to the physical network. And then there was the VMNet one, which is host only, which is what I think what Matthew was trying to say, private. Um, it's it's uh, it's a little bit different to the idea of private because it will, later on we'll talk about private, uh, but um, it's uh, it's as the name suggests it's host only only inside the host does not have any connectivity to the physical network in any way. Okay, so that's what we know already with VMware Workstation. We hopefully all of us are familiar with that. What we also know in VMware Workstation is besides those three, we can create more virtual networks. We can create bridge networks which are which are which are uh, <clears throat> which are which are which are connected to different physical networks. So if you remember when we go to the network editor so you're probably wondering why why the hell is he going through this well I know this well what I'm trying to do is confirm some knowledge here and obviously it will make it easy to understand later on. So if you notice there, I'll, I'll, here's VMNet2, I'll, I'll just add a new network so we can add, let's go VMNet19, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> we can add additional 
networks and by default that's a host only but we can actually choose oops there's a there are no unbridged network adductors uh, we can actually bridge it, but uh, right now I'm not so sure why that's bridged, uh, why that's uh, not allowing me, but we can actually I bridge it. I can answer that. Basically, I think it only allows one bridge network for one VMnet, I believe. That's just how VMware is configured on Windows. I've always tried doing that before. I'm not sure if that's the actual case, but that's what uh, I've always come across. So what we should be able to do is actually choose, this, instead of choosing automatic, which basically picks up your... Uh, physical network card that's actually connected to a network. So, for example, if you've got an Ethernet and Wi-Fi and others, you could uh, <coughs> it will detect the active connection. So, if you had Ethernet plus Wi-Fi, obviously you, your Ethernet it trumps the Wi-Fi and uses your Ethernet. But you can see that there's various connections, and on mine there's a, a few more than what you normally see, um, including a virtual box which is another virtualization tool, uh, which is actually not a physical adapter. But we can actually select the Ethernet connection, for example. And now we can actually create, it's probably because it was on auto, we can create another one which uses the Wi-Fi uh, connection, if you guys see that. So we, even in VMware Workstation, we can actually uplink our, our virtual switches, if you like, that's a word, in the physical world where you're uplinking a switch is where you connect one switch to another switch and if it's a Cisco switch you use a crossover cable if you remember that and basically that is the term uplink so now we're working in the virtual world and you can see we've got that default VMnet 0 <clears throat> which actually has a connection to my Ethernet so my cabled network card if you like it's not plugged into anything right now but uh, that's what it would bridge to so effectively, that would uplink to the physical switch, which is at the end of other end of that cable. If you guys are, are with me. On the other hand, I've created another bridge network, as you can see. But in this case, I'm using the Wi-Fi as my uplink. And to be honest, if I had multiple physical uh, Ethernet cards, I could just keep on doing this. So effectively, I am able to create virtual switches which connect to different physical switches. Is everyone with me on that idea? So obviously if I click OK to this, yeah, if I click OK to that, uh, and it's going to break a lot of my stuff, so I better fix it. I could actually go to my DC, for example, edit this, and I could actually go to my network card. Oh, it's, it's paused, unfortunately. So go to my Windows 8, that's not paused. And when I actually go to my editing my my uh, network, instead of actually choosing bridge, which gives you uh, VMnet zero, I can actually choose custom and specifically choose 19. If you see that, and if I choose 19, then I know that this uh, this uh, this virtual machine is going to be connected via the Wi-Fi adapter to my Wi-Fi access point, which might be a different totally different physical network to say my default bridge I, I can create many other uh, other networks as well so that means i can actually have a one host with multiple network cards and multiple virtual switches which are uplinked to different physical network and create a virtual network infrastructure that resembles what that of the physical network let's say a tafe sa something we can all understand we have many many networks okay each subnet is a network as you all know so if we had that if we had that let me just give you some reasons for having those different subnets obviously we would have different subnets for different broadcast domains different security domains or for uh, or for traffic segregation so therefore, let's say at TAFE, we've got the student network, which is what you guys would be using in the, in the classroom, as well as in the library, as well as in your Wi-Fi, okay? There's probably more network, more student, different student networks than just those, but they would be classified as a student network. We also have what's called a server network, okay? So this is not where a client computer would connect, not the staff, not the, not the students, 
but mainly the servers plus the ICT. Then we have the staff or admin network, which is where lecturers like myself and other people who work at TAFE actually physical, physically connect to. And the reason for that, obviously, is that some of these uh, networks will contain different types of people. So therefore, we can create rules. Let's say there's a uh, there's a uh, there's a uh, there's a service. Let's say a student record serv uh, service that's running on a server. But in our firewall, we can create rule that allows the, the the staff network to the server while denying student network to the server. Can you guys sort of understand that? So that means we're able to create these rules for separating the types of uh, controlling access for the different protocols as well as the different services as well as the different locations. So if that's the case in TAFE, what if we had a server, uh, a, a Hyper-V server that, uh, that needed access from many, many different networks, physical networks that is. So what we need to know is that we can actually create virtual switches which uses the different physical network cards to uplink to specific physical switches. And that's what I'm trying to get at. As soon as we understand that, that we can uplink to multiple, multiple physical networks, it's easier for us to understand here. So I'm just going to reset my to defaults before I totally break my system. So if you, you, as you all know, if you've messed up your virtual networking and uh, we could just restore to defaults. But well, I, I won't do that because I've created these networks specifically for my requirements. And I'll remove that one and I'll change this back to automatic. All right. So let's get into the actual notes now. All right, so we're, today we're going to create and configure virtual machine uh, uh, networks. So today we're going to create a virtual, uh, use, sorry, we're going to create a, and use Hyper-V virtual switches. We're going to use advanced Hyper-V networking features, and we're going to configure using Hyper-V virtu uh, networking virtualization. So let's uh, let's get into exactly what it is. So Hyper-V virtual switches, uh, you can see right at the top right, compares with VMware V switches, but not the VDS, which is a VM <laughs> virtual distributed switches. Okay, uh, v as I said, it's not uh, it's a comparable to the virtual switches, which are basically standard switches, whereas the v VMware distributed switches is uh, something a little bit different. Um, so basically, the virtual switch, you could almost think of it and treat it like a physical switch. They just don't exist in the physical world, but they act and behave pretty much like the physical switch. So it's a software implemented layer two switch. So it's a dumb switch, if you like to think of it. Layer two, meaning it's really working with MAC addresses and is really not doing much more than uh, yeah, switching, uh, sending traffic based on MAC addresses. And obviously, uh, with at that level, that's uh, there's always also the VLANs that we'll talk about later. Um, so there's do doing nothing more than that. So it's it's a very simple switch. But having said that, we can do a little bit more uh, later on. I'll talk more about that in a second. So it connects virtual machines to the virtual or private uh, physical networks. Okay. So when it says uh, so, obviously. The virtual switches can be created as an internal one, like uh, we mentioned. Uh, so that means it's similar to the idea of the host only, where it's only there for communicating between VMs on the same host. Or it can be configured to uh, communicate to the physical networks. The parent partition. Parent partition. Remember we spent a little bit of time last week talking about that parent partition? That's basically the operating system that was on the server that you turn into Hyper-V. The actual Windows installation becomes what's called a parent partition, which is a special partition that is used to manage the Hyper-V server itself. So the parent partition is also a VM, 
and as a result, we'll have to use virtual switches as well as virtual network interface cards to communicate with the network as well as the virtual network. Um, it's extensible. The term extensible means you can extend it. All right, so for example, I'll give you an everyday example of extensible. So if you got a car, that's great. That's good for driving you back and forth to from A to B to wherever you need. You got a bit of storage and so forth. But that's pretty much it. But if you add a tow bar to a car, that suddenly makes that car more extensible, which basically means you can actually now, with that tow bar or with that connection point, with that interface, if you like, add a trailer, add a caravan, add a bike rack. So you can see how you can add more features to your car because you got that extensibility through that tow bar interface. So what we're saying here with the extensible, it means it uh, actually allows us or programmers or third party developers to extend the features that it's uh, currently uh, offered. So you have some advanced features can, uh, and it can be replaced. So some of these advanced features include policy enforcement. Whenever we hear the term policy, it really means rules. Uh, it talks about isolation, so we're isolation is obviously isolating the traffic, isolating the virtual machine, or for whatever reason. It could be because it's we're gonna we need this uh, to be isolated because we're testing viruses on this virtual machine, for example. Uh, we could use uh, traf traffic shaping. We all know that what that means. That means if you go over a certain limit or you uh, you want to slow something down, you shape it, which basically limits the bandwidth a, a device or in this case, virtual machine has. And also we can actually create protection, which again, uh, we can actually uh, configure firewalls on these virtual networks, uh, which are protected networks. It will be, it will come up later on. Um, these virtual switches are managed by Hyper-V and obviously Windows PowerShell. Okay, I always say it. Anything you can do with the GUI, you can do with Windows Microsoft PowerShell. For example, the get VM switch will give you get you information about the virtual switches you have. Uh, so the parent partition again can have multiple virtual NICs. So, so you, you're gonna get you're gonna get a little bit confused between physical NICs and virtual NICs in a second. But what I want you to think about is uh, I'll explain it a little bit more in the next picture. They can be, um, the parent partition can be connected to different virtual switches and they can have different bandwidth limitations. So let, let's have a look at this picture. So this is on the parent partition guys and on this computer, you have a physical ethernet network card and a Wi-Fi network card. Okay, very similar to what you probably all have at home right now. But you notice that there's also this V ethernet bracket external. So what that actually means is this is a virtual Ethernet, uh, even a NIC, virtual NIC. And external is the name of the switch that you gave it. I could call it external and not and actually be internal. So that's just the name. It's what you actually configure it that whether it makes it truly external, meaning communicating to the physical network or not. So basically in that bracket, that's basically the name of the virtual switch that this virtual Ethernet adapter is connected to. Let's have a look at um, what we've got here, okay? So he here's some PowerShell commandlets, and to be honest, I don't necessarily need you to know how to do these, but obviously be aware that we can. But here's some examples, okay? So as you know, uh, the, uh, PowerShell is always a verb noun. So in this case, the verb is add, and the noun is VM network adapter. So add a virtual network, virtual machine network adapter. All right. So what that's doing is adding a new virtual network adapter. It's going to be called management, and it's going to allow management uh, OS. Okay. Let's have let's have a look at this. And the next line is the same, but it's going to be cool storage. And that one is the same, which is going to be live migration. So that management OS is the parent partition. 
So as a result of entering these three commands, what you end up with is a is a virtual Ethernet adapter here that's to storage. And there's another one for manage, management, another one for live migration. So these are virtual uh, network cards for various reasons. All right. The parent partition has physical network adap adapters as well. So if you look at this, these are the physical network adapters, aren't they? Whereas these with the V in front of it are the virtual network uh, network interface cards. Um, each uh, so each virtual machine and the parent partition has a virtual network adapters. No, hopefully no problems. Each virtual network adapter is connected to a virtual switch, and it's just like you, every machine you have these days has a network card. But that network card to actually make it work is has to be connected to a switch, and hence the virtual network adapter needs to be connected to a virtual switch. There's types of virtual switches. Okay, so these are VMware, uh, no, sorry, these are Hyper-V terms, not VMware terms, but effectively meaning the similar things. Uh, external, connects to the physical network, whether that be wireless or Ethernet. Uh, ex internal, which is like our, what we know with a host only, uh, which is actually only available to the virtual machines or the parent. Uh, connections only. And there's private, which is actually only for virtual machines, not even the parent. Okay. Uh, the configuration, what we use is the virtual switch manager and in your labs you'll walk through a couple of examples of that to create virtual switches. We can use the virtual machine settings to connect to a specific virtual switch. Uh, so very similar to the idea of us connecting our virtual machines by selecting the the virtual switch it's uh, connected to. Bit like us going here and going to our network card and selecting the, 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 the network it's connected to, it's the same idea. All right, so types of virtual switches, let's uh, ha have a look at this. So first of all, let's actually look at this. This uh, green colorful network interface card is a what's called a physical adapter. This grayed out network uh, card is a virtual adapter and this device is a switch. So on the parent partition, so which is the host, the Hyper-V's operating system if you like, uh, you have physical adapters, no problems. Uh, on the virtual machines you create, you have virtual adapters, no problems. And obviously on each of these, uh, the parent or the virtual machine, you have programs, apps, which actually need to communicate. If you have a private switch, you can see that the virtual machines can, are connected to it and they can communicate with each other. But you can see that even though it's defined in the parent because everything is defined in the parent because that's the Hyper-V itself, the parent itself has no communication with this private virtual switch. So it's only for virtual machines not and excludes the parent. We could have an internal virtual switch and this is more like our host only, all right? Because we know that our host only is inside the host, but our host gets a VM net adapter to, to that virtual switch. So if you remember, I'll give you an example of that. If you remember from your VMware, if from your VMware, that when you create a virtual switch, uh, VMNet one, for example, you have. Uh, let's view this in a little bit more detail. you know that if you create a host only, your host machine gets a VMNet adapter, which is a virtual adapter to the VMNet switch. So that's more resembling what a internal switch is. You've got virtual machines which connect to it and you've got the parent that connects to it, but none of these virtual machines has a method of reaching the physical network. 
Okay, even though the parent's connected to this and it's got a physical network, in this case, the traffic, there's no NAT device or no router or anything like that that gets, that, uh, <clears throat> that allows these virtual machines to connect to the physical network. All right, so it's still isolated. So this is really isolated, not even the parent has access. This is uh, isolated, internal to the host. And it doesn't, uh, so, so, so we've been talking about having multiple Hyper-V servers. But if we create an internal switch on Hyper-V1, for example, these virtual machines can't talk to the virtual machines on Hyper-V2 because obviously, as, a, as you see, there's no way of going through the physical network to get to Hyper-V2. But you can do NAT if you want to, okay? You can add that functionality afterwards, but the internal is what we start off with. External. Uh, this is like our bridge network. In this case, uh, we have the physical adapter on the parent, but when we create a virtual switch that uses that as our uplink, we actually basically turn that physical adapter into a switch port. Okay, just like if you've got a Cisco physical switch, you know that they've got ports. In this case, it's turning that physical adapter into a switch port. Just like you know with a, with a uh, Cisco uh, switch the switch ports doesn't need to have an IP address, so therefore this physical adapter does not have an IP address. What happens instead is that you get a virtual network interface card created on the parent, which gains the IP addressing information originally on this physical adapter, so that the parent can still use this and get to the physical network. And now these virtual machines, which are plugged in or connected to this external switch can go straight to the physical network and exist on the physical network, just like our bridged. So if we think about addressing, this private has an internal IP addressing that's got nothing to do with the physical network because there's no way of communicating. This internal has an internal communication, uh, internal IP addressing that's got nothing to do with physical network because it, it normally doesn't connect. But if you add this NAT device, which is similar to our net, NAT network in our uh, VMware, then that NAT translates from the, this, uh, this internal network to the physical network. Whereas the IP addressing of all these parent as well as the virtual machines which are connected to this external switch, they all have IP addresses which are consistent with the physical network and can communicate with the physical network like we know with the bridge. All right, so here's a pic picture example. You've got two network cards, physical network card, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, just like what we've got in front of us, probably. Uh, in this case, both are disconnected, but don't even worry about that. All right, so we're going to use a command let new VM switch, new basically virtual switch. The name of it is called public, and then it's going to use a network adapter called Ethernet. And uh, basically, it's saying use this physical network card to uplink to the physical world and allow management OS true, which is basically the parent partition, allow the parent partition connection to it. And then you get a new switch, which is created, okay, called public. It's an external switch type, and it's using this particular physical network interface card. And what happens is that this physical adapter becomes that switch port, like I was saying, so it loses all its IP addressing information, so there's no IP address. But what it had is passed on to this physical, uh, so to this virtual Ethernet, which actually is uh, brackets public because it's connected to public, the switch called public, and it'll get the same IP addressing information that was originally on that physical adapter. Is that wrong? So with me so far, guys, just give me a thumbs up, guys, if you are understanding what I'm saying. It's a little bit confusing. It's a little bit confusing because you're losing the information on your physical adapter because it becomes a switch port, but you're getting a virtual adapter on the parent so that you can still connect, <laughs> communicate with the, with, the, with the physical network, and that's picking up the IP addressing information that was originally on that physical adapter. Okay, good. Okay, everyone's give me that thumbs up. Let's have a look. Okay. All right, so that's what happened there. Now we're going to create another new switch. 
the switch type is internal. So if you remember that was internal was similar to the idea of the NAT where you, it's an internal one, but you can add NAT network address translation functionality. And in this case, it's the name is gonna be host. Okay. And if you remember the, the internal switch allows uh, for the parent partition to connect to it as well as VMs. As a result, there you go. Because it's an internal uh, virtual switch, the parent partition, so this is in the parent, gets another network adapter, virtual network adapter. In this case, that's actually plugged into the, to the host virtual switch. Well, yes, because how else would you connect to the physical world? Yeah. So yes, anything. Uh, if you want an external switch, then it needs a physical adapter to connect to the physical world. Okay. W with this one, there was no physical adapter associated with this switch because it was an internal switch. The next one we're going to uh, in this example is a new uh, private switch. So if you remember, the private switch was like a internal switch, except that excludes the excludes the parent partition from even getting involved just for VMs. So it's a new switch. Uh, the type is private uh, and the name is called also private. So uh, the names, so don't forget, these are just the names of the switch. Uh, what they actually are could be internal private or uh, external, but they could have all sorts of names. It just happens that this is what they used. So it's private, only VMs, not even the parent partition. So what happens is it's created, but you notice that there was no additional vir uh, virtual Ethernet uh, interface created. And that's because, and that's because the parent, so don't forget, this is the parent partition, isn't it? The parent doesn't have access to the private switch. So therefore, we don't need a virtual adapter on the parent. All right, hopefully everyone understands that. Let's keep on going. The next thing is VLANs. All right, so guys, have you guys all done uh, Cisco VLANs, uh, CSN? Cisco scouting networks? Or are you doing them? Yeah, you have. Ethan, what about the rest of you? Uh, Nicholas has. Reese is doing it currently. So have you guys got up to VLANs yet in this, uh, in uh, Reese? Uh, Raymond has. So Reese, have you guys got up to VLANs yet in the uh, CSN? Okay, so what is the function of a VLAN? Yeah, it's a virtual LAN. What's the function? And obviously that virtual is not to do with Hyper-V, is it? Yeah, exactly right, uh, Alex. Split networks. Uh, not private networks, Raymond, but just splitting the networks. So normally if you have a switch, all ports are on the same LAN. Okay, that's just a physical network. But if you introduce VLANs, it means that some ports or some interfaces can be part of different uh, LANs. Okay, so you can have, with one switch, you can have more LANs than the single switch would give you normally. Um, and, and the reasons for that is, like we said before, for security, for, you know, so we can have different subnets, so we can have different administrative areas, different rules traffic segregation, all those reasons why you would have different networks is the reasons why you have different VLANs. But the thing is, VLANs can exist over several services, can't they? So we can have, uh, let's say the VLAN 10 exists on switch one, switch two, switch three, and switch four. But obviously that means that if I have a computer that's on switch one, which is on VLAN 10, and there's a computer on switch four, which is also on VLAN 10, they have to be able to talk to each other, don't they? So how are, so what is the port called that's, uh, what is the name of the port that connects these switches 
together. What type of support is it? Yes, all switch ports are switch ports. What type of port is is this port that connects all the switches together when you uh, when you have VLANs? Anyone? All right. Yes, Nick. Good one. Okay, good one, Nick. Trunking ports. Okay. So basically, the, the 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 purpose of a trunking port is to pass on this VLAN information. If it's not a trunking port on the two switches that are connected to each other, then this VLAN information is not passed on. Okay. This is what's called VLAN tagging. So if I have a computer on switch one, which is a part of VLAN ten, then it is tagged. Its communication are tagged with VLAN. 10 and when it actually goes through and sends this information goes through this uh, trunk port through a cable to another switch to another trunk port that switch that is receiving it knows can see that the vlan tag is for 10 so it only sends it out of the ports which are associated with vlan 10 and so forth so that's why we can actually maintain the vlan identification across different physical switches Ah, so now it brings us to this idea. So VLANs is used to isolate network traffic for nodes that are connected to the same physical network. VLANs are used by Hyper-V to isolate Hyper-V server management networks, to isolate virtual machines that are connected to the external switches, to isolate virtual machines on a single Hyper-V server. And VLAN ID can be configured on the virtual machine network adapter. So you go in, you give it a, it's a, it's a configuration you give it if it's on VLAN 10, for example, you would just configure it to be on VLAN 10. Whoa, just think of that for a second. What is this? What is telling us here is that the VLAN tags that are on your physical network can span and go into the virtual network. So therefore, if I have a server that's on my Hyper-V, which is part of VLAN 10, which is the same as those other VLAN 10 computers we talked about on the physical switch 1, 2, 3, 4, it means that if our virtual, if our Hyper-V server had a network, the physical network interface card that's connected to that switch is used by the virtual switch and, and that physical port on the switch is configured as trunking that vlan id or vlan tag can be passed on from the physical world to the virtual world and vice versa meaning those computers which are on vlan 10 can access this server which is in the hyper v which is also on vlan 10 whereas if you if you have other other virtual machine other machines which are on vlan 20 or or something else they couldn't unless they were into VLAN routing. All right, so VLAN ID can be configured on virtual machine network adapters or external or internal virtual switches. Okay, so we can even have virtual switches which are purely in the virtual world have different VLANs as well. So we can separate virtual machines between networks like that. But to be honest, it, why would you have that unless you, uh, you could just create another switch anyway? Um, VLAN is limited to a single physical subnet, so VLAN ID has 12 bits, up to 4,094 VLAN IDs can occur. Okay, let me just check out if anyone's got any comments, because, uh, yeah, so I think you guys are just saying the same stuff I was saying. All right, so let's keep on going. So advanced Hyper-V network features. So the key point out of that is that VLANs can extend to the virtual world, basically. Uh, some of the net advanced network features, networking features. So we can actually, so obviously we should all know uh, what ARP is. Uh, so from your Cisco address resolution protocol. And basically that is where we discovered the MAC address of, um, of computers on a network when we need to communicate them if we know their uh, IP address. 
Um, also, there's a network uh, neighbor discovery poisoning protection. So let's have a look at what this talks about. So ARP and neighbor discovery poisoning uh, protection protects against ARP and neighbor discovery spoofing. So in cyber security uh, or in, in cyber security or in a cyber attack, one of the ways that someone can actually attack you is to spoof. Spoof is a word that means pretend to be something else. Okay, so if I was an attacker, I could potentially be sending you ARP updates or ARP information. So falsified ARP information. Let's say that the gateway had this MAC address and it had this IP address. I could just actually send you ARP uh, address resolution protocol uh, packets or frames that uh, that said that my IP address is the same as the gateway, and my MAC address is my MAC, uh, is actually a, my MAC address. So what happens now is that you're gonna your computer is gonna get a mapping that has that the gateway IP address is mapped to your this particular this other MAC address. So what that means is that these vir virtual machines or physical machines can actually uh, when they need to use the uh, gateway, they will instead of sending it to the proper gateway, because don't forget there's a IP address, MAC address, source destinations, IP source uh, destination MAC addresses. So when we send it to the to the wrong MAC address, it means that my computer now can act as a man in the middle attack, intercepting your communication between you and the gateway, which is pretty much every time you want to get off your network. And I could be looking at what data you're transmitting. Or information you're uh, you're sending. So by implementing this ARP neighbor discovery poisoning protection, that actually protects you against this uh, man in the middle attack. There's also DHCP guard protection. So we all know about the term rogue DHCP servers, which is a DHCP server in the virtual network, which or in the physical or virtual network that is giving out IP addresses which is wrong deliberately wrong or unintentionally wrong. So again, if I had a DHCP server, I could be giving you wrong gateway information and again set up that man in the middle. Um, so DHCP guard just basically protects against rogue DHCP servers in, uh, in a virtual machine. So the virtual machine will be blocked from giving IP addresses if it's determined to be a rogue DHCP server. There's port ACLs. ACL stands for access control lists, basically, um, yeah, permissions, if you like. So port ACLs enables the isolation of allowing or denying traffic. So we mentioned trunk mode before to a virtual machine. Trunk mode forwards traffic from multiple VLANs. Uh, network traffic monitoring. So these are some more features that we can use to monitor network traffic in the virtual world. There's also bandwidth limit, limiting and burst support, which basically allows us to control how much bandwidth virtual machines are getting access to. Um, so virtual switch extensibility. Remember I said that extensibility means you can add additional features to it. So extensible, extensible means we can do uh, add NDF, uh, NDIS drivers, WFP uh, callout drivers. So adding these drivers allows us to uh, now plug in third party tools to actually interact with our virtual switch. Some, in, some extensions include ingress, forwarding, egress, and monitoring. So ingress is coming in, egress is going out. If you guys, uh, if you guys ever hear those terms, uh, probably heaps of term, times when you're talking about firewalls. Uh, well, just think about it uh, like I N for in. You're probably going E. Uh, what does that mean? Exit. Okay. So that's how I remember it. Ingress means coming in press is going out in exit and forwarding and monitoring so we can actually use that to monitor forward traffic filter based on ingress and egress and uh, virtual switch can be replaced okay so this is how they are uh, stacked up in the virtual switch interacting your virtual uh, physical adapter so therefore we can do a, we, we can add all these functionalities and the best thing is we can use third party software 
to access information from here to create reports to actually visualize what's happening and all that kind of stuff. SRIOV, single root IO virtualization. Basically, this is a hardware feature that is in, available in network adapters, physical network adapters. And obviously, if it's if it's a NIC that has it, that's good. So hint hint, if you're looking for a physical hardware to use for a Hyper-V server, the network I uh, not network uh, uh, so SRIOV feature in that hardware would make it work a lot better. So it's a physical hardware feature. It provides direct memory access to virtual machines. And what that does is instead of actually you utilizing the host to communicate with the, uh, uh, communicating with the network adapter, you're actually, it's virtualization aware and gives uh, direct memory access to the virtual machine to the network card. So that increases uh, network throughput, reduces network latency, uh, reduces the CPU overhead of the Hyper-V server because you're bypassing it basically. Uh, so you're sort of uh, not using the Hyper-V to send this information, you're bypassing it to make it more efficient. The machine bypasses the virtual switch, not but not so much it doesn't use the virtual switch, it does uh, just bypasses the virtual switch so it can offload this lot of the processing or work from it. And it supports live migration. We'll talk about live migration. It's basically moving your virtual machines from host to host without downtime. Uh, even when different SR IOV adapters are used, we can use the, this feature. So different vendors, different physical vendors for the physical cards. So basically, if you look at this diagram, normally it goes from the physical switch to the uh, physical adapter to the parent partition to the virtual switch, goes through the VM bus, then it gets the VM uh, virtual machine. So a lot of processing and work happening here. But with this SRIOV, a lot of those functions are directly communicating between the virtual machines to this uh, physical network uh, interface card that is capable of this. So offloading the processing from the host CPU memory and so forth. There's also a dynamic virtual machine queue. Whenever you hear the term queue, is a lineup, okay? So it's lining up to get some to be processed or something to happen. So network adapters use uh, receive queues to route traffic to appropriate virtual machines. So it's receiving all this information from the physical world. And there's, let's say, 10 different virtual machines. So it's, it's getting, it's receiving all this traffic. What it does is it actually places a queue and uh, basically works for them one by one as you would if you go to McDonald's and you line up in a line to buy stuff. They work for it one by one. Um, the physical network adapter must support VMQ. And again, it's a physical uh, physical hardware feature. Uh, it dynamically uses uh, multiple CPU when processing the virtual machine network traffic, which basically may, means it, may, uh, it may, can process this queue uh, more efficiently and faster. A DMA, direct memory access, reduces the CPU overhead to the uh, Hyper-V. Again, giving that uh, virtual machine's direct memory access to this NIC reduces the work that the host, Hyper-V host needs to do. It's beneficial when you receive a lot of network traffic. Okay, VMQ is automatically configured and tuned. It's based on the process, so networking and CPU load. VMQ is enabled by default on virtual network adapters, but used only if your physical network adapter is capable of it. That's a key thing. Again, it's another feature you should be looking for in your hardware. Here's some more advanced features. Remember we talked about the DHCP guard, router guard. So basically that DHCP guard protects against rogue DHCPs. Router guard drops router advertisement and redirection messages from unauthorized virtual machines pretending to be the router. Uh, and we can also have MAC address uh, spoofing, which basically allows virtual machines to change the source MAC address in outgoing packets to to one that's not assigned to them, you can enable it or you don't enable it. You're probably going, why would we enable it? Well, you can enable it if this happens to be a monitoring virtual machine. 
There's also this port mirroring. And again, this port mirroring allows network traffic of a virtual machine to be monitored by copying the incoming outgoing packets. So instead of just going through the switch and going off to the physical network, we can actually mirror this. And instead of going to the physical network, it sends it to a monitoring device or PC. Uh, uh, Nick, so we'll talk a bit more about that in the future, but Nick teaming basically allows us to configure multiple physical network cards to work as a team, obviously providing uh, increased bandwidth and redundancy because if they're working as a team, if one of them gets unplugged, then you still have that one there uh, working. So Nick teaming in virtual machines provides redundancy and aggregates bandwidth. The term aggregates means combines. Okay, can you define what lag is? Or where we uh, type there? You disappeared off my. Uh, yeah, table. so I'm not, I haven't heard about it too much, but I hear like la uh, lag is like combining multiple cables or multiple Ethernet connections and into which, one. And I believe. Which, uh, which technology was that part of? Oh, I'm trying to remember because I've only briefly heard it because um, it sounds similar to it, but I'm not necessarily okay. sure. So this, the same. This, that's okay. It probably is uh, similar, but I have to know a little bit more about it. But mm. that's basically uh, in VMware, there's also this, uh, this uh, similar things to Nick Teaming, but Nick Teaming itself is a, is a Microsoft thing. So you can have Nick Teaming without having Hyper-V. So you can have Nick Teaming in the physical uh, server if you wanted to. I think it okay, stands for link aggregation, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, Possibly. Uh, that, that sounds like more of a Cisco thing. Link yeah, aggregation. Okay. Yeah, so that's the same idea, having multiple network interfaces working as the one uh, to give you redundancy and aggregates bandwidth. So aggregate means combines bandwidth. Yeah. Can be used uh, at the operating system or the virtual machine level. So multiple physical network adapters in a, in a uh, new a NIC team. If a physical adapter fails, the virtual switch still has connectivity because it has another one. Multiple virtual network adapters in a NIC team. If a virtual switch fails, the virtual machine still has connectivity because it can go to a different uh, virtual switch. So this doesn't make sense, does it? So basically what this is saying is that if we have multiple physical network adapters in a NIC team, and that's the adapter that's being used by the virtual switch to connect to the physical network, if one fails, the virtual switch has one to go to. But if we're talking about multiple virtual network adapters in the NIC team, that's basically on the virtual machine. It just means that each virtual machine, uh, the, each of these network adapters could be plugged into a different virtual switch. And if one of the virtual switch fails, the virtual machine still has connectivity through a virtual network card to the other virtual switch, if you like. It's just basically having that multiple path idea. Uh, it's particularly important when you're using that single root I virtualization. Uh, because the traffic bypasses the virtual switch, and it's intended and uh, intended and optimized support uh, teaming for the SIOV may be used with a virtual network interface. The virtual machine must have multiple network adapters and must be connected to different virtual switches if you use it in a virtual machine. Uh, MAC address uh, spoofing must be enabled. So again, in this case, because they have multiple network cards. Uh, both network cards will have the same MAC address effectively, so they can communicate on both. So that if one fails, that communication still gets to gets to that uh, machine. All right, we're almost there. So configuring and using Hyper-V network virtualization. So let's keep on going with this one. So let's have a look at this picture, guys. So. These are physical switches, okay? Can you guys all see my mouse pointing to these? They're all physical switches in the real world, okay? All right, so then we have uh, physical hosts, which are the Hyper-V hosts. So we've got some hosts here, some hosts here, some hosts here, and then we've got these, these little things, which are virtual machines. So when we're talking about multi-tenanted network, we're talking about uh, a network which has multiple companies uh, machines running on it okay so multiple companies oh, think 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 Amazon web services uh, web services think Microsoft Azure 
they're the perfect example where they're hosting services and servers of multiple companies. So that means they're a multi-tenanted network. But obviously, if I have, in this example, three different colors, meaning three different colors, and we've got some of their virtual machines running on each of the different Hyper-V hosts, we don't really want their their traffic to be mixing with each other. Obviously, you know, if I was uh, I was uh, company A and my traffic was mixing with company B's, there's a it's a it's a security risk, isn't it? Privacy risk. So what we can do is use VLANs. So what does that mean? So remember, with VLAN separates these LANs into different segments, if you like. So therefore, on the Hyper-V virtual networking, we can configure three Vs: green, yellow. So green, orange, and blue. On the physical networks, we would have to configure the same same uh, VLANs, and we know that with the trunking, it passes through from the physical world to the virtual world with the VLAN tags. Well, that's fine, but what if we add another virtual machine here, which is on the orange network? Well, what does that mean? That means we have to configure the virtual switches you know, of that VLAN. We have to configure these physical switches to know of this VLAN. Well, if I add another orange one here, well, then I will have to configure, 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 configure. <sighs> okay, so I'm not sure if you guys are tired yet, but that's a lot of configuration, isn't it? All right, so we're besides actually configuring uh, these VLANs uh, all over the place, physical and uh, virtual, you can see that uh, just three different colors and we're doing a lot of configuration. All right, so yeah, it is possible. It's possible to use VLANs to separate and isolate traffic on the same physical infrastructure. So VLANs are often used, but it's limited. Okay, you're probably going to say 4,094 uh, 4, VLANs is limited. Well, if you have like uh, literally tens of thousands of companies being hosted on your physical infrastructure, yes, then that 4,094 is not quite enough. Um, VLANs cannot span multiple subnets because basically on the same VLAN, they're on the same subnets. Well, that limits things a little bit. So it's challenging to reconfigure when you're adding or moving virtual machines from host to host, as you saw with uh, my deep breath, because that even looked like a lot of work for me. So providing multi-tenant network isolation, we can use private VLANs, which address some of the uh, scalability issues and reduces the number of virtual uh, IP subnets on VLANs. Virtual switch can limit uh, virtual machines to the same VLANs. We can use port ACLs, access control list, and but it's challenging to manage and update the access control list, especially when things are dynamic. Hosts are being added, hosting removed, virtual machines are moving around, network uh, physical network infrastructure being added, this, uh, removed, and so forth. It's it, like you got to understand that when we're looking at something like as big as something like a Azure Enterprise uh, or even our private cloud when it gets that big where we are hosting multiple tenants, it's very hard. A lot of work for even tiniest little changes. You get me guys? So it's not so bad when your whole network infrastructure is for one company and your virtualization infrastructure is for one company, but when you have multi-tenanted and you want to isolate the traffic from each other, then that's where this is going to be a bit of a problem. So what we do have is what's called software-defined networking. Okay, we'll talk more about this in the future. And this is how cloud providers actually, uh, actually do it. So let's look at this picture now. So we've got blue and red. Basically, blue is a one company, red is another company and they exist on the same physical servers, same physical network infrastructure. So server virtualization, multiple virtual machines on the same physical server, each virtual machine is isolated from the other. How though? Network virtualization, multiple virtual networks on the same physical network, each network is isolated from the other. But how? All right, so what we're trying to achieve is that the blue network, is existing on the same physical network, but cannot see or be seen 
by the red network. That's what isolation is all about. So how do you get something like uh, this is a virtual machine to communicate with everyone here and also communicate with the physical network and not be able to connect uh, and the same for the red but not communicate with each other. That's the problem, okay? So some benefits of uh, network virtualization is a flexible virtual machine placement. You can move virtual machines around with no impact to the physical network, no reconfiguration of VLANs, no reconfiguration ACLs, etc., etc. So multi-tenanted network isolation without VLANs, IP address reuse, what does that mean? It means that the IP address I use for company A or the blue company can be the same IP addresses I use for the red company. Whoa, I'm not sure if you guys heard me. Doesn't that mean we've got IP, duplicate IP addresses then? How is that possible? Hopefully you guys are sort of thinking about that. You know, hopefully your mind are, are being blown a little bit. It, it basically means that the IP address I'm using for the red and blue can be the same IP addresses, then they still work on the physical network. The same physical network as each other. So that is, that is uh, mind blowing. So it allows for a live migration across subnets, is compatible existing network infrastructure. You don't have to uh, change your physical network at all. And it's, transport, uh, it's transparent moving our virtual machines uh, to the shared IAS cloud. It's transparent means you can't see what's going on. It just goes there and works. So because that's how it works in IAS clouds. So let's have a look at this, a little bit harder look at this. Okay, so we've got blue, we've got red, and they exist on the physical server. Whoa, if this blue server is 10.1.1.11, that's the customer address space, you notice that this red IP address is still 10.1.1.11, and this one's 12, this one's 12 as well, but the physical network IP address has nothing to do with any of those, does it? And that's this. That's the way it works. Okay, that's the way it works. But how does it work like that? Well, there's a. You guys have heard of the term encapsulation, haven't you? That's where things are wrapped up in another thing, in another thing, in another thing. So basically, we're adding an extra layer of encapsulation. So if we're looking at this blue now, this this computer here wants to talk to this computer here. So it wants to go from 11 to 12. So it sends it out of the network card just like normal. It goes onto the virtual switch like normal and it goes to the physical network as normal, gets to the other physical network, comes into the virtual switch, gets into this virtual machine. That's what we want to achieve. What it's actually happening is it's sending like normal, but when it gets to the virtual switch, it's adding this extra, extra, bit of addressing if you like. It's a GRE key. Uh, yeah. GRE key and you notice this is 5001. Let's talk about the red now. The red is the same. This guy wants to talk to this guy, same physical network infrastructure, but you can see that the GRE key is 6001. So what's really happening is it's actually communicating over the virtual switch, gets encapsulated, by the by the what's on the physical network gets the other server gets decapsulated strips off this physical IP uh, physical network uh, IP addressing looks at the GRE key works out that the GRE key in this case is 6000 is meant for this red company then it uses the red company's uh, puts on the red company's network and it gets there so customer address space is based on virtual machine configuration. Provider address space is based on the physical network and it's not visible to the virtual machines. So what are virtual uh, networking, uh, network virtualization policies? So define customer address space provider address mappings, specifically on the Hyper-V server virtual machines are running. Uh, the Hyper-V implements uh, policies by translating the incoming and outgoing packets. And if the virtual machine is moved, the policies are modified and the virtual machine configuration stays the same. So 
this is an actual example, still red and blue, but basically, in this case, it's a name, uh, it's Blue Yonder Airplanes, Woodgrove Bank, and they could be sharing the same address space. And you can see that they're not, their traffic is not actually, they're not able to see each other's traffic. So basically, if you like to think of it, there's an extra layer of encapsulation, which encapsulates after it leaves its customer bit of the network into the provider, which is the AWS, for example, or Azure. The provider address is the actual physical network, gets through the physical network, however that may be, and gets into the other host, and then it actually decapsulates and you start using the address, customer address space after it looks at the which network it belongs to, which customer it belongs to. So this is effectively, it's a little bit mind blowing, but this is how software defined networking works in real life in the cloud. It removes any connection of your customer's virtual machine's IP addressing from that of the physical IP addressing, which means these virtual machines can be just chucked on any host and as long as the hosts are configured correctly for the physical network, these virtual machines will just work because of that extra layer of encapsulation. All right, are you guys with me on that? I know that's a little bit mind blowing. It's a little bit harder to understand. It's not a VLAN. Uh, Alex, it's, uh, the GRE key is not a VLAN ID, so it's totally different to the idea of VLANs. But basically, it's an added layer of encapsulation, if you like, a, like to think of it, okay? Um, it's if you want to think of it as similar, yes, it could, probably could think of it as similar, but it's not actually exactly the same. All right, so that's good. Um, so any questions about that uh, software defined networking? It's not something we're going to be using in our worksheets or assignments. It's just something that to be aware of, and we'll cover it again when we look at um, look at the VMM. But this, but basically, that software-defined networking is how the cloud works. That's why they can have so many customers. Uh, each customer could be using IP addresses wherever they like. But how they, how do they get it to work on the physical network because of that encapsulation? How do they, uh, how they're able to reuse IP address because of that encapsulation? Mm -hmm.